So thank you very much for this opportunity to give, to give lectures here. And I hope they will be useful. So I, still, I, I need to adjust myself to the audience. And uh, I will stop many times just expecting if you have some questions. So and I will start quite slowly. Unfortunately, the most difficult material will be in the third lecture, which probably is difficult to digest because everybody will be probably tired. So this you saw already more or less in the announcement. Um, and uh, let me just repeat that theory and observations of uh, neutrino flavor transformations play the key role in developments of neutrino physics in, say, in the last 40 years. Because most of the information about neutrinos and, as we think, the physics beyond the standard model we got from studies of, uh, of these transformations. So um, they have ap applications to many things, to solar neutrinos, to supernova neutrinos, to neutrinos propagating through the Earth, to cosmological neutrinos, to astrophysical neutrinos. Uh, theory of uh, neutrino transformations in vacuum and in medium include vacuum oscillations, oscillations in matter, adiabatic flavor conversion, parametric resonances, uh, collective effects due to scattering of neutrinos on neutrinos. So what I will do here, I will make some physics derivations of uh, various results. I will try to escape long formulas and many pages of uh, different uh, statements. So what I will do, I will present physics picture of uh, different phenomena from which you can get results immediately and simpler. So, and the results are quite precise, as you will see. So without lengthy derivation. I will also comment on some possible implications to the physics beyond the standard model. Although mostly I will focus on the standard model effects. So what I will present is my shortcut to derivations of results and to understanding results. So I'm in the field 40 years. I'm trying always to get some explanations in a simple, as simple as possible way and to have straight derivations of complicated results. I hope it will be useful for you. So I will give three lectures uh, about three neutrinos, mostly. And uh, the plan is already known. So I will first start in the first lecture talking mostly of these flavor states of neutrinos. And there are some subtleties still under discussion in the literature about what are these uh, flavor neutrinos. Then I will introduce mixing, coherence, and oscillations. The second lecture will be devoted to matter effects, basically oscillations in matter and adiabatic conversion. And the last lecture to more advanced topics uh, like uh, parametric effects, oscillations in multilayer medium, and the neutrino neutrino scattering and collective transformations. So let me start my first lecture. And I will discuss first flavor and mass states and flavor in the presence of massive neutrinos and mixing. What are these flavor neutrinos? So these are electron, muon, and tau neutrinos. And they are neutrinos associated or corresponding to certain charged leptons. Like uh, electron neutrino corresponds to electron, muon neutrino to muon, tau neutrino to tau lepton. And the correspondence is established by charge current weak interactions. So that flavor is characteristic of interactions. And flavor states we call sometimes weak interaction states in this respect. In fact, the presence of vacuum mixing and masses introduce some ambiguity in this definition, which one should keep in mind. And in fact, there are two different ways to determine flavor states. One is theoretically using Lagrangian of standard model. And the second one, phenomenologically. So let me do these two things and show you what is the difference and where it can be important. 
So in the standard model, neutrinos and corresponding charged leptons form doublets, electroweak doublets. This means that they uh, enter the same charge current currents like electron neutrino and electron form charge current the same way is muon neutrino and muon and tau neutrino and tau lepton so these are the interactions which identify the flavor of neutrino state and the standard model this is neutral current interactions in the standard model and these interactions are flavor blind these interactions do not pick up certain flavor, and different flavors have the same interactions. This is important for our further discussions. So this is the part of Lagrangian which actually identifies flavor states in the standard model. And this part conserves electron, muon, and tau lepton numbers. Now, mixing means that uh, flavor states do not coincide with mass states. And they are combinations of mass states described by mixing matrix. So that flavor neutrinos uh, are mixing matrix, or PMNS matrix, multiplied by mass neutrinos. So in the three neutrino case, we have three flavors, and then three mass states the states with different mass, with de definite masses. I will not distinguish here states and operators, for my discussion is not important. But you should keep in mind that uh, operator is something which acts on the vacuum and then produce the state. And therefore, for instance, if this expression is written for operators, then for mass, for, then for uh, states, you need to take your conjugate. Okay. I will kind of skip this complication, but you need to keep in mind this to be very precise if you want. Now, I will say a little about masses. So for my discussion, difference between Majorana and Dirac uh, masses will be practically irrelevant. And just let me remind that this is the form of Dirac mass term in Lagrangian. Uh, which actually connects left-handed and right-handed components of neutrinos. And these are two independent components, left and right. In contrast, in the case of Majorana neutrinos, we substitute the right-handed component by charge conjugate of the same left-handed component. So these are two component neutrinos in contrast to, to, to Dirac neutrinos. Well, I will skip. Uh, uh, the rest of this slide by just saying that this mass term precisely corresponds to Majorana neutrinos, which satisfy the property that the conjugate of this state equals the same state with some possible phase factor. And this alpha is so-called Majorana phase of neutrinos. Now, let me repeat again. This is how we parameterize this uh, mixing matrix, the PMNS matrix. We have flavor states. These are mass states, and these are notations of the elements of the mixing matrix. Now, let me underline one thing, which is trivial, but for some reason, people sometimes are lost when we go to effects in matter. Mixing plays dual role in the following sense. Mixing determines the flavor content of mass states. So we can write the formula which relates mass states and flavor states in this way. It is just conjugate of what you saw in the previous slide. Now here you see uh, uh, Hermitian conjugate. And this means that mass states are combination of flavor states. We just inverted the formula which was before. And according to this formula, mass states contain different flavors. And you see here this uh, typical mass spectrum, which corresponds actually to normal mass hierarchy. These boxes correspond to mass states, nu1, nu2, and nu3. And you see that each of these states is combination of different flavor states. In my lectures, red corresponds to electron neutrinos always. 
uh, green to muon neutrinos and blue to tau neutrinos. And there are some kind of debates. So which color should be assigned to which neutrino? For instance, for instance, Boris Kaiser say, oh, electron neutrino should be green because electrons are around us. And this is what we actually want and like. So, so but anyway, in my lectures, red is, is, uh, is for electron neutrinos. By the way, this picture I have kind of invented many years ago, I think in 95. And people didn't accept this almost during seven years. She said, didn't understood, what is this? So what you see here, the sizes of these colored boxes correspond here the probability to find, say, electron neutrino or muon neutrino in a given mass state. So suppose you produce in your experiment neutrino nu1, beam of neutrinos uh, nu1, although this is kind of Gedanken experiment. Usually we are not producing a given mass state but some combination. But anyway, so if you produce nu1, then say in in 60% of the cases, it will interact as electron neutrino, something like 15% uh, as muon neutrino, and 15% as tau neutrino. So this is the meaning. And uh, these probabilities are given by the elements of mixing matrix. For instance, this is given by UE1 moduli squared. Here, this one is given by U mu3 moduli square. And it is u tau 3 moduli square. And here you see we have this mass splittings. This is famous u e 3 This is the mixture of electron flavor in the, the third state, isolated state. So let me stop at this point and ask if you have some questions. Or if it's clear, then. where you know that uh, it involves a charge of current, and you produce a muon. So you have a probability that the, the neutrino beam could be new one or new two or new three. That, that. OK, so this is the second part of, of this diagram. As I said, this mixing play the dual role. One is that it determines flavor, content, or composition of mass states. Inverting this formula in this way, it tells us what is mass composition of flavor states, right? So for instance, this is mass composition of electron neutrino. It mostly consists of a new one, one third, something like this, of new two and small piece of new three. So if you produce, for instance, muon neutrino and you put mass spectrometer, then, say, in half of the cases, your neutrino will interact as, as uh, neutrino heaviest one, nu3. Uh, in, say, again, say one third cases, it will be like nu2. Uh, and with smaller probability, you will have this nu1. So your mass spectrometer will show three peaks with amplitude given by these by this sizes of these boxes. And this is for tau neutrino. And this is for tau neutrino. So mixing determines, as you, as you see here, mass content of flavor state. So if you have flavor state, then mixing tells you what is the mass content of your states. And simultaneously, according to this relation, it determines flavor content of mass states. This is important, and I will use this. It looks like very trivial, right? You just you have this connection between flavor and mass states. You have this mixing matrix. You can you know, put this mixing matrix uh, on the left side, on the right side, and you have this physics interpretation. Clear? OK, good. So this is standard parametrization of our mixing matrix, UPM and S. And it is the product of three rotations. And this is complex matrix. And this is very convenient, actually, for phenomenology. It's not, uh, it's not accidental that we are using this standard parametrization, although the physics results should not depend eventually on parametrization of this matrix. And some people are using different parametrizations. 
So this is the standard one when you have this first U23 rotation, rotation like in this uh, space. So again, imagine that these are flavor states and here is mass states. Uh, and uh, so this is matrix in between. Then you use 1, 3 rotation and then 1, 2 rotation. And the point is that in matter, this is extremely useful parametrization. Because if you consider the things in matter, then you can, to a large extent, eliminate this and also complex phase. So you can eliminate this by changing the basis. And in this way, you do not touch matter effects. So in fact, this simplifies enormously consideration. For instance, if you want to see CP violation effects, if you want to, see, see, uh, to compute CP violation effects, that uh, you go to this specific basis when you do this rotation, and then you eliminate CP phase from propagation. So you can consider propagation of neutrinos without any CP violation. And then CP violation appears just in the projection. I don't want to uh, uh, go into details of this, but I'm just saying that this is very important and exceptional parameterization. All this is, of course, not unique. Uh, so here is the matrix of Majorana phases, which I will not use mostly because it is not relevant for, for this propagation. So this matrix is, uh, can be seen if neutrinos are Majorana particles. Now, in terms of mixing angles, so we introduced two mixing, three mixing angles, which are this rotation in three-dimensional space, one, two, one, three, and two, three. And here you see connection between these mixing angles and elements of this PMNS matrix. For instance, one to mixing give us the ratio of this red part over this red part in two, in the second and the first state. One three mixing gives uh, element here, so a mixture of electron neutrino in this heavy state. And two three mixing give the distribution of muon and tau flavors in the third state. So it's essentially 2, 3 controls the ratio of uh, this blue tau part and muon part in the heavy state. And we have two, del uh, two delta m squares, mass square splitting. These are important oscillation parameters, of course, which is m3 square minus m1 square and m2 square minus m1 square. So we still don't know what is the ordering of uh, a neutrino masses, it can be normal ordering, which I have discussed now, but it can be inverted ordering so that uh, this isolated state, the third one, with small admixture of electron flavor, has the smallest mass, and two are uh, heavier, heavier. So actually, you can denote your states, what is this one, two, three, by using electron flavor, so that the state one is the state where you have the biggest amount of electron flavor. Second state is when you have a say, kind of intermediate amount of electron flavor. And uh, the third state is where you have small amount of electron flavor. So identification of mass ordering is one of important problems in neutrino physics these days. Now let me come to phenomenological determination of uh, flavor states. Uh, the flavor nu, uh, neutrino state nu alpha is determined as the state which is produced together with charged lepton L alpha, this conjugate, or produced when L alpha is captured, like electron capture. You have electron capture, you produce neutrino, and this neutrino we are saying is electron neutrino or itself, this neutrino produces uh, the charged lepton L alpha in interactions. So examples of here, if you are saying, oh, I have neutron decay, and in neutron decay, I produce electron. And therefore, I'm saying that the state of neutrino, which is produced in this decay, is the electron antineutrino, electron. In the case of pi and decay, you have muon, this is uh, the most important mode, the dominant one. If muon appears, then we are saying, oh, neutrino state which appears together with muon is muon neutrino. So, but actually, real neutrino state which you are producing is real processes should be computed. And it is process dependent. 
This is a subtle point which one needs to understand. So we can rewrite our Lagrangian in this form in terms of mass states. This is charge lepton, and this is mass state. But now we need to introduce, of course, elements of PMNS matrix. So this is the relevant Lagrangian for our consideration. We have these charge current interactions and the mass terms. And I have written here for Majorana neutrino. But you can do the same for, for Dirac neutrino, too. Okay. Now, using this Lagrangian, you can compute what is the amplitude of probability and probability to produce neutrino with a given mass. So these are mass states, right? Because I just written flavor state, uh, new L, in terms of mass states and mixing matrix. Using this Lagrangian, you know QFT rules, you can just compute what is the amplitude of probability that new one is produced, new two is produced, and new three is produced. And you need to consider this as a kind of coupling for, for this production. Mass states uh, can be considered as asymptotic states. Because if you have these decays or processes in vacuum, then your mass states can propagate without any change, because they are, they are eigenstates of uh, Hamiltonian in vacuum. Nothing happens with new 1, new 2, and new 3. And so you can consider them as asymptotic states and proceed with usual QFT rules. Right? You have Initial state in minus infinity, final state in plus infinity, and then you compute what is the amplitude and then probability of this process, in contrast to oscillation processes, which I will discuss later. So in this case, the state which is produced in a given process with the given charge left on L can be represented in this way. So look at this carefully. Actually, I will not produce show you many formulas, but some of them you, you need really to, to understand well. So what is staying here? I make summation over, over mass states. Because with a given charge lepton, I can produce new 1, new 2, and new 3. Now, here is element of PMNS matrix, Li. So L corresponds to corresponding charge lepton. I is to mass eigenstate. And this is the amplitude of production of this state uh, uh, new i, right? So I put uh, out this PMNS element for convenience. So this is, this is uh, essentially the amplitude or wave function. Actually, this is wave function. If you assign, uh, add also this uh, just plain wave uh, exponent, then you get the wave function of your neutrino, which is produced, OK? And it's normalization factor. So you see what is you can find in this formula that this neutrino state, which is produced with a given lepton L, is not just given by PMNS matrix, as it was in our theoretical uh, uh, determination. But also this appears, this additional factor, which takes care of uh, the amplitude of production. This factor depends on the mass of neutrino. So I reproduce the same formula again. For usual light neutrinos, dependence of, uh, of these wave functions or amplitudes on masses is very weak. Usually, it's correction of the order of mass of neutrino over energy squared. So you consider kinematics of such a process, find the amplitude, then include neutrino mass and see how the amplitude depends on the mass. And it depends extremely weakly. Okay, So if you have, say, Beta decay, you have energy of neutrino in MeV range. And the masses of neutrinos is 0 0.01 electron volts. So it's uh, eight orders of magnitude squared. Okay? And the correction is, say, 10 to the minus 15, 10 to the minus 16. Negligible. If so, then this is the same for all neutrino masses. 1, 2, and 3. And so you can put this out of the sum, include in normalization. And everything is reduced to our standard expression when a neutrino flavor is given by PMNS matrix uh, multiplied by, so, and this is mass state. But you should 
keep in mind that actually what is behind this is that we just neglect dependence on masses of the production amplitudes. OK? Small correction still exists, but you can neglect. And this is the difference from, from theoretical definition of flavor state. So this is theoretical definition, and this is phenomenological with this additional amplitude. Yeah? Um, is there any um, possible physical process with uh, energy is actually very small? like neutrino mass itself, so that the correction can be significant? Yeah, in practical sense, we, we, we have no such beta decays with so small uh, uh, energy release. Well, for relic neutrinos, mm -hmm. for relic neutrinos, that can matter. But we are too far to detect, say, processes using relic or cosmological neutrinos. Mm -hmm. However, this kind of exercise can be important if we have heavy leptons, which are mixed with uh, uh, our usual neutrinos, so that in our Lagrangian, nu L is given by the sum of these admixtures of light neutrinos plus heavy neutrino. Well, actually, this, for instance, always appears if you have CSO mechanism, because you have right-handed neutrinos, which are heavy, or so you have this uh, uh, singlet neutrinos, and they have some admixture in the, in the light states. Usually, this is very small if you have high-scale CSO mechanism. However, if you have TV-scale CSO mechanism, then this kind of admixture or this element, ULN, can be not small. It can be detectable. And we actually are putting bounds on these elements. So in the presence of heavy neutral leptons or singlet, fermions. This is the theoretical uh, definition of flavor state. This is what is staying in the same doublet with uh, charge lepton L. Now, if this N is heavier or much heavier or heavier than energy release in our process, this part will not be produced, but just kinematically, right? So we cannot produce this N. And what you will produce in your weak processes is just this part the first part. And of course, it will be not a whole state. And therefore, this is what you will say as phenomenological flavor state. And this is what is theoretical. And the difference here due to the presence of the heavy, heavy neutrino. So there are important consequences of this. Because if this is what you call phenomenological neutrino, then you will have breaking of unitarity. So that the sum over this U L I over the light components will be given by R 1 minus this U uh, L N square. So the sum of this and this gives you 1, but not this one. So you will have unitarity violation. And you will have also violation of universality, because in the, for electron, muon, and tau neutrino, you may have different admixtures of this uh, heavy, heavy neutrino. And therefore, you will have additional factor, which gives you non-equal coupling constants for electron, muon, and tau neutrino currents. So actually, this is interesting uh, problem. And people are looking for possible deviations from unitarity. And a number of experiments are now running to put the bounds on possible unitarity violation. Yeah? Is your actual neutral leptin N like that? So first of all, we don't know. So that's if it exists. Mm -hmm. The good motivation is seesaw mechanism, which explains smallness of neutrino mass. So we have a mechanism which can explain why neutrino masses are very light. They imply existence of uh, heavy leptons or of this type of the objects. But there are many other proposals when you expect to have some additional uh, leptons, which are kind of singlets for, of the standard model group. Yep. If we measure the breaking of the interest, then that will be the heat for the heavy 
And actually, a lot of people from Ice Cube are here. So one of the programs in Ice Cube is to, to measure couplings of, of tau lepton and tau neutrino. And one of the goals is to check this, uh, this uh, uh, unitarity, because it's not well tested for tau neutrino line because of difficulty. So we have good bounds on, on this uh, electron and muon lines. The second important consequence is so-called zero distance lepton number violation. So in oscillations, you produce electron neutrino. And if you put detector close to your production point, then you will again detect electron neutrino. So you will have this flavor transformation uh, far from your production point, far enough, so that this lepton number violation develops in the course of propagation of of neutrinos. Here, in the case of uh, this admixture of heavy lepton, you may have, you will have non-orthogonality of neutrino state L and L prime. So you just use this formula and then compute this matrix element. So nu L and nu L prime, say electron neutrino, and this is muon neutrino. This is given by the sum of uh, sum of these mixing matrix elements. And it is not 0 in the presence of heavy element. It will be given by this product of U, L, N, conjugate U, L, prime, N. I think it should be prime somewhere. Oh, I have forgotten. This means that you produce electron. You, you have the process with electron. You put closed detector. And the state of neutrino, which you are producing with electron, can immediately produce muon. No, no need even to develop this lepton number violation or change of lepton number. You will have immediately lepton number violation process. Clear? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Lepton flavor violation, sorry. So I'm speaking here because I said that I'm not touching this Majorana nature, so it's lepton flavor violation. Again, so what you expect in this case, so-called zero distance violation of lepton number, we are saying. Again, let me repeat. You have the process, say, with production of electron. So for instance, some beta decay. You put detector very close to your source. And neutrino, which is produced together with electron can immediately produce muon in the detector because it is not orthogonal to muon neutrino because of presence of these heavy, heavy new leptons, neutral leptons. More questions? So what was the known bound for? Yeah, so the bounds are at the level of 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3. Now, interesting question, who mixes neutrino? So how come that we produce certain combination of mass states? And it's interesting that this is interplay of various factors. So first of all, we deal with charge current interactions. And then we deal with some specific kinematics and with different difference of masses of charged leptons. And actually, this is why we produce some specific combinations of, uh, of uh, mass states of neutrinos. So for instance, in electron neutrino, so electron neutrino is produced in beta decay. And why it is electron neutrino? It is just because. Uh, the energy release is very small in beta decay. So we cannot produce muon, and we cannot produce tau. For time being, I'm forgetting these subtleties with a kind of presence of heavy leptons. So I'm back to the standard situation with just uh, three active neutrinos. OK, so this is kinematics works for us. Now in the case of muon neutrino, we produce them in pine decay. Why? So we also produce electron neutrino and uh, electron in pi and decay. But this is very strongly suppressed mode. It's chirality suppressed. So we have the dominant mode 
this muon neutrino and muon. So again, it's kind of funny things interplay of these kinematics, which tells us that in pion, we mostly produce, we produce muon neutrino. OK? Now, tau neutrino is produced uh, uh, in usually what we are doing is in the case of ds, d mesons. And uh, here what we are usually doing is we do beam dump experiment to enrich neutrino flux. Because in the DD case, you produce uh, different neutrino species. And you can produce also muon. You can produce electron. You can produce even tau. So you produce tau. So you produce all three charged leptons. Now, how we get this specific situation, a specific combination of mass states? So what we use here is, uh, again, different kinematics. Because if we have tau lepton production, and kinematics of D decay with tau lepton production, of course, different with kinematics of uh, production of electron and, elect and corresponding neutrino. So which means that in different kinematics region, we have different content of electron, muon, and tau neutrino. So think about this. So it's very non-trivial. We have this kind of Lagrangian of the standard model. That's everything is clear charge current. But uh, in reality, so we need to take into account kinematics of the process to see why we are producing a given combination of mass states. Now there are a few questions. Because in some processes, especially in the decay of heavy mesons, we produce simultaneously both electron neutrino, both electron and muon and tau, like in BD case. The same process. So what is neutrino state which is produced in, in this process? Which is non-trivial, actually. Non-trivial. They are producing some mixture of electron, muon, and tau because, because they are kind of entangled, as we are saying. And only in certain kinematic considerations we say, OK, so here in this kinematic region, mostly we have tau neutrinos, or mostly electron neutrino, or mostly muon neutrino. Think about this non-trivial stuff. And then what about neutral currents? What is the state of neutrinos which is produced in neutral currents? So Z boson decays into three neutrinos. So we are saying electron, muon, and tau. Why electron, muon, and tau? Why not nu1, nu2, and nu3? Z0 has coupling which is flavor blind. It doesn't distinguish flavor. And then non-trivial question, what is the state of neutrino which is produced in Z0 decay. How to write it? It will be actually coherent combination of nu1, nu2, nu3, or nu e, nu mu, nu tau. It's not just separately we are producing nu e, or nu mu, or nu tau. And then another question immediately can these neutrinos which are produced in Z0 decay oscillate? It was kind of a question, essentially, experiment, say, 20 years ago. But now people are discussing to detect neutrinos which are produced, for instance, at LHC, because we have an enormous number of these Z zeros. And so we can even detect these neutrinos which are produced in these heavy particles, but, uh, decays. So the question is, we have these Z0 decays. We produce some neutrino states. And uh, so do they oscillate or not? So what, what's going with them? So what they will detect? So what I will do, I will give some answers later. So, so in, in the end of, of my three lectures, right? So you may, you may kind of come with some suggestion. Or maybe someone has the answer already now. So we have Z0 decay. Are these neutrinos oscillating, or what's going on? I have not yet discussed oscillations. So maybe after, I will ask you this question. Now, coherence and oscillations. Uh, this is Bruno Ponte Corva. And so oscillations, we are defining them as periodic transformations of one neutrino species into another one, of flavor neutrino. So there are consequences of mixing and production of mixed states. Oscillations is the effect of propagation of mixed states. And this is interference effect. Actually, this is effect of the relative phase increase in your system with time or with distance. And I will explain these things. 
Now in the literature, unfortunately in many, many, many books, you can find a uh, rather confusing presentation of, uh, of oscillations, mostly because authors probably understand what is what is correct one, but they're just to save the space and, uh, and uh, to, to, to be shorter, they present this either using infinite space and plane waves. So plane waves consideration. But plane waves are correct when you have infinite space. And oscillation is a finite space process because you have production, you have detection region, and there's certain distance between the production of neutrino and the detection. This is important. This is finite size phenomenon in space. So in this consideration, one needs to have some additional constraints to get, to get, to get correct results. Because otherwise, you need to consider infinite space. Now, in some cases, people still treat neutrinos as uh, just particles, like point-like objects. But then the immediate question is, OK, if they are point-like objects with different masses, they have different group velocities. And therefore, they stop overlap immediately, and oscillation is interference process. So there is no interference if your states stop to overlap. And then again, some cooking to explain, well, you know, we can do something. Yeah. So both are wrong. And the simplest, simplest consideration, which doesn't have kind of conceptual problems, is in terms of wave packets. So this is kind of intermediate between these two because wave packets have finite size, right? So that it's not point and this is not infinite. This is something which is composite. So I will present here the theory of neutrino oscillations using this wave packet analysis. And uh, although we will get the results which the same as you get in these wrong kind of considerations, it, is not, it is, doesn't have any misconception. And the problem is that when some young per person starts to study what are oscillations, he immediately ask, uh, meets these kind of problems in these approaches and then start to write wrong papers. Because, oh, start to correct theory of neutrino oscillations. So, so now it's not too many papers, but some years ago it was almost every year several papers with some kind of improving the uh, theory of neutrino oscillations. By the way, let me mention this. Leo Stodolsky has written a paper, which is a very important paper, actually, in this field, saying that in most of the cases, from practical point of view, and practical considerations, so consideration in terms of wave packets is not necessary. That's true. It's not necessary for practical considerations. However, for conceptual issues, for understanding what's going on, you need still to go and to consider wave packets. So this is what is written here below. Well, again, even coming to now oscillation theory, we have Lagrangian. I mean, we know what is QFT, or we can use quantum mechanics. And then using this, uh, using rules of quantum field theory, you can compute everything, right? So this is what we are. This is the main claim, right? So we can compute everything. No Lagrangian, you know the rules. You just make straightforward computations. And so you can compute observables, a number of events, etc. So that looks straightforward, but not really quite uh, simple. And so let me remind that quantum mechanics, uh, so neutrino oscillations, quantum mechanics at macro <laughs> macroscopical scales. So what's the problem? And the problem is the following, that actually even QFT formalism should be adjusted to specific computations, to uh, computations of specific processes. Usually what we are doing, we are considering asymptotic states of kind of scattering theory. So what we are using is scattering theory. So we have initial state, which is asymptotic state. We have final state, asymptotic state of non-interacting particles. Then they approach each other in some region, in the interaction region. And so they interact there and go out. So our formalism is essentially adjusted to, to this type of the processes, with what we are usually using. And this uh, simplifies a lot of computations, because for asymptotic states, we can, we can just use plane waves. 
plane waves in our integrals eventually give delta functions. And everything is kind of very simple. Now, oscillations is finite size phenomenon. And therefore, all the complications come from this. And then we use usually some approximations. And the point is that if you do not do any approximation, then it's nightmare to make computations of your oscillation processes. Essentially, I don't want to explain this more unless you ask me. You need to start from the beginning of the universe, because, because if you consider oscillations of neutrinos, you need to know what are the properties of, of, of parents of this neutrino and how they interact. To know the properties of parents, so you need to know why functions of, say, nuclei, which decay and produce neutrino, you need to know the properties of these particles. You need to know wave packets of wave functions. Now do you need to know what, how this, your parents were produced, etc. So you sh essentially should start from the beginning of the universe you know, to, to, to be absolutely precise. So at some point, we need to make truncation of these computations. So this is oscillation setup. And I will explain something using this setup. So we have source of neutrinos, where neutrinos are produced. Uh, with some external particles, say here are some nucleon or nuclei, and then you have uh, production of, say, charged lepton, and then neutrino, then neutrino propagates, you have detector, and this is detection region, and again, you have some uh, accompanying, accompanying particles in this case. So again, this is finite size phenomenon, and we are talking about baselines L, which is distance, say, between uh, middle of this production region and the detection region. So we have two interaction regions now. Not just one as a usual uh, scattering processes, but two. Two, we have two regions. Well, we can actually still apply this uh, asymptotic uh, consideration for, for this uh, production region and separately for, for detection region. And use wave packets for propagating neutrinos. And the best way is to use mass states, because nothing happens with these mass states when they propagate in vacuum. So this is how we are doing, essentially, computation. For neutrinos, actually, you can use uh, oh, either this wave packet picture, or you can use quantum field theory formalism for uh, hold the process, and for neutrinos, you can use propagators, right? Imagine you have propagators which is, say, 10 kilometers long, or by 100 kilometers long, so neutrino is produced in one point, detected, say, 100 kilometers further, and you can describe this by propagator. Why, why not? Of course, this is complication, and people have studied this, what, what kind of correction. So the simplest way is just to say that these neutrinos are on mass shell, and so you can consider the propagation as propagation of uh, real particles and describe these by wave packets. So you compute the amplitudes of the process of production neutrino, of production neutrino here, propagation, and uh, the detection for nu1, nu2, and nu3. And you have three amplitudes. And I sum up these amplitudes, and then you will get oscillation pattern. Now, I mentioned already this, and this is just repetition that you actually describe everything in terms of uh, mass states. I don't want to, to repeat uh, all this uh, stuff. Important simplification is when we are doing factorization of all the process. Actually, the precise thing that you consider everything uh, and, uh, uh, as a single process, production of neutrino, propagation, and the detection. This is kind of complicated. And if oscillation effects can be neglected in the production region and inside your detector, then we can truncate the process. So we can say, OK, so let, let us treat this production region, uh, uh, production process as kind of usual S-matrix scattering process, and we compute what are production of a given mass state. Then we consider propagation of the wave packets of mass states. And then separately, we consider detection or region. And again, using S matrix formalism, find what is the uh, amplitude or probability here. So we do this factorization. Uh, and now, what is actually giving us factorization? Of course, this is size of the so production region and detection. But at fundamental level, 
This is determined by the wave functions of the particles which are involved in this process. So at fundamental level, what matters is localization of your parents' particles and particles with which neutrinos are interacting. So in this formalism, you still need to use wave function of your nuclei or nucleon, which produces your neutrino, and uh, the wave function of uh, particles with which neutrino interacts. So this gives localization of production and detection region. So let me stop a little bit and questions. Are these scaling or S scales are roughly given by the energy of involved interactions? This one. This is what I'm saying that, that actually determined uh, uh, by these wave functions of, say, nuclei which are decaying. So, for instance, it can be very small. So, of course, eventually you need also to integrate over a big region. You have, for instance, the sun where neutrinos are produced. So, you need to finally integrate over production region uh, in the sun. Or for reactors, for reactor neutrinos, you need finally uh, integrate over the size of reactor core. However, for this quantum mechanical thing, what is important, how your nuclei in reactor is localized. Okay? It is this what determines the size of the wave packet of neutrino. Localization of parents. Um, yeah, yeah, so that produces also uncertainty in energy. So uh, you, you need actually to take into account both uncertainty in, in energy and therefore in the time of production and also detection. And I will actually give some important example for this. And uh, the special uncertainty. Yeah, everything should be kept. More questions? Can I ask uh, what is the typical energy scale for the neutrino production? Energy scale? Yeah. Well, it de what is the energy of the neutrino production? So if this is angles, if the energy could be very low, like uh, sub EV, then we have all the Three have different mass and the velocity and yeah, so I will not consider this situation. That requires special treatment. So I will consider ultra-relativistic neutrinos, avoiding this kind of problems with, say, relic neutrinos. For relic neutrinos, you, you need really to take into account all these things. So, so uh, that's special issue and special treatment. So I'm considering here ultra-relativistic neutrinos. The energy of neutrinos is much, much bigger than masses. Okay. So now let me give derivation of the oscillation form os oscillation form oscillations or probabilities. Huh? I'm sorry. Yeah. Before going to this uh, I think this uh, issue is uh, important in any physical process such as even um, the LHC because we are thinking of some particle colliding yeah. and interact and produce some particle and detect. Well, if you consider oscillation of pro, uh, processes, then it, that is important. Yeah, I mean, in principle, it, it, can, it can be important in any case. Yeah. Okay. But especially important for oscillation processes. Right. Yeah. Well, if you have, of course, say, D0 or B0 oscillations, you also need to take into account to some extent this formally. Now, now we're kind of ready to make derivations of neutrino oscillations without any problem, conceptual problems. So suppose neutrino, nu alpha, is produced in the source centered at x equals 0 and t equals 0. And there is some production region. And let us consider neutrino propagation outside the production region. So we are considering kind of intermediate part in our diagram, previous diagram, when we just consider neutrino propagation. In this case, in general, our neutrino state 
which is already go out of the production region. It already formed the wave packet. Uh, it has such an expression. We have the sum over mass states. K is 1, 2, 3. Now we have this uh, mixing matrix element. Now I put here Doug, uh, conjugate because uh, for states you need to put conjugate if it is not uh, for, for operators. And then, then we have this, uh, the wave function, uh, the function of uh, x and t. And we make summation. And this is our mass state. This is very general. Right? So gen in general, you can write your neutrino states in this way. So k is One, two, three, mass states, mass states. So everything in the mass states, which is kind of the best way to consider uh, the, 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 the problem. right? So and this is a wave function which actually should be computed, as I discussed before. Right? It should be computed somehow. And you can need to find what is this wave function. Now, in general, this wave function can be represented as the integral over momentum. And here we have, uh, say, the plane wave. And here we have uh, this uh, function, which is function of momentum. PK is average momentum. P is running momentum. And this is a general form for wave packet. So wave packet is kind of the sum of the plane waves with certain weight. And so in general, our wave function can be written in such a way. So energy here, k, which, so it's correspond to a given mass state, is just given by square root of p squared plus mk squared. Okay? So this is momentum distribution function. And we assume that it is peaked at some average momentum p, k. Agree? This is, this is very general. Now, let us expand this energy expression for this around the mean momentum. So what is this? So we have this here energy uh, for, for running momentum, p, for, uh, for which we make an integration. Now we can expand this in this way. So it's energy k in, at p k. This is average momentum plus this derivative with p minus p k plus this term, etc. I will just do Taylor expansion, right? Or just using 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 this expression and make derivation. So what we will get here? So this is the energy e k, which corresponds to average momentum. Now, dEk over dP corresponds to group velocity. So this is group velocity, which is given by pK over energy k. Again, you get this by doing differentiation of this expression. So this term, which I will not focus much, it actually describes the spread of the wave packets in the space. So if you produce wave packet, it propagates, but it also expands. Just because in your wave packet you have uh, neutrinos or components with different energies, right, and different momenta. And therefore, uh, so the, the, this wave packet exp expands. I made probably some comments later. Now, so let us neglect this, uh, the third term, which is responsible for the spread of the wave packets. And then we just take uh, this expression for, for our energy. It's uh, energy for uh, average momentum, and then the first term, which is phase velo uh, group velocity, p minus pk. And let us insert this expression for energy in our formula for, for the wave packet. So here, let us insert this. And then, just trivial, what we will get can be written in this form. Do you see well this, what is written here? So what is written here is the product of two factors which is called phase factor and shape factor. The phase factor is, again, I have written here. It is just given by the phase computed for average momentum and the corresponding energy. Right? So these factors do not depend on p, and I can put this out of the integral. So the best way is you just repeat. This is trivial. You can do this in, in five minutes. Now, what is left? is this what we call shape factor. And it, is, it has the following form, following, following expression. This is the integral over dp. This is what is left after you put out p independent terms. And then you have this uh, fk uh, 
over p, I made some shift of p because uh, it's from, z from infinity, from, from zero to infinity, you can make the shift. And then the, the rest of the phase, which is left out of, of, of this. What is important, and you can check this expression, is that this shape factor depends on x and t only in this combination, x minus v group velocity times t. This means that this uh, shape factor describes propagation of the wave packet with group velocity vk without change of the shape. Okay? So phase factor depends on average momentum and energy. This guy depends on x and t in this combination and describes the propagation of the wave packet. So again, to, uh, to make a computation of oscillations, you need actually to compute this factor, which depends on the production. But what I will show you, that in most of the cases, the specific form of this shape factor is essentially irrelevant. So that's interesting. So we try to compute wave, wave uh, th this, this uh, <laughs> shape factor, so wave packets for certain uh, situation. So for instance, you have accelerator experiment, you produce in collision of uh, a proton pi mesons, which then decay in decay tunnel, uh, which has some finite shape. This is the shape of the wave packet. And here you have absorber. And uh, so, and then neutrinos propagate and are detected in your detector. What's interesting that the shape factor, so your wave packet has such a funny form with this exponential tail. That essentially reflects decay law of your pion in your, in your uh, uh, decay tunnel. Okay? So shape factor may be very complicated. It's not just like you know, usually some, uh, some peaked function. So it's, uh, and here is exponential with some cut here and cut here. And the length of the wave packet is uh, given by, uh, by, by, by some factor LP, which is the size of the, of the decay tunnel, multiplied by, by this essentially Doppler effect factor. So what happens, that pion actually decays in the tunnel, but this is coherent process. If you do quantum mechanics, you should take into account that pion, a given pion can decay here, here, or there, or here, right? So if pion decays here, then neutrino is propagating, and that forms this front <coughs> part of the wave packet. Now, this back part is when pion decays somewhere here, because pion has lower velocity than neutrino, so that uh, neutrino uh, component which appears here uh, is a retarding one. And you need to take into account that pine still moves with some velocity, and therefore this type of the Doppler effect factor appears. And now the question. Actually, when we realized uh, these uh, things, we immediately start to think, so what experimentalists are doing? So when they are computing, say, neutrino fluxes in your detector, they consider the problem incoherently. They're saying, OK, we have decay tunnel. And then we compute how many pines say decay in the beginning of, of, of tunnel, then later, later, and in the end of the tunnel, and then make summation, okay? But this is incoherent. If you respect quantum mechanics, you should say, okay, my pion, which is propagating in the decay tunnel, has the amplitude of probability to decay in the beginning or in the end, and this decay is coherent process. You say, oh my God, so people did computations in the wrong way. All these computations for, for neutrino fluxes and neutrino experiments are wrong. Any guess what, what is? And let me repeat again the problem. The problem again is that if you have pion, which doesn't interact with walls, and you just freely propagate, and according to quantum mechanics, all the process should be considered coherently. And you need to take into account that there is certain amplitude of probability that pion decays in the beginning of the tunnel, in the middle of the tunnel and in the end of the tunnel, and everything should take, be taken into account at the amplitude level. So we kind of uh, 
try it hard. And it turns out these coherent and incoherent considerations give practically the same result. So although you see people do not aware about this problem, they do some incoherent computations. But the result is very, very similar to what you get in this more strict quantum mechanical consideration. So why? Long story. <laughs> but it happens that you get the same, the same result. So it depends really on the, uh, the system, I mean, the size. No, it depends on. The, it doesn't depend if you do uh, uh, this uh, uh, coherent consideration, or you just say, okay, I have a flux of pions, and then some number can decay in the beginning, some number of uh, uh, in the so middle. You don't know when they decay, right? You don't. You don't detect the pion. Exactly. So therefore, you need to consider quantum mechanically, and you do this in, in, at. But what experimentalists are doing when they're computing? This is a neutrino flux. They are doing this in incoherent way. They say, okay, we have flux of neutrino well, pines. Some of them decay in the beginning, some in the uh, intermediate, some in the end. Okay, uh, in the and then some just in the probability, some fluxes which appear in diff from different parts of decay tunnel. So, how do you compute for the incoherent decay? Well, for, for, for incoherent, it's easy. You just have pines and you compute using just exponential law, how many pines you know, decay in the beginning. So therefore, you, can, you know what is the flux. Then so in other po points of the decay tunnel in, in, in the end. And then you sum up fluxes produced in different parts of your decay tunnel. So this is incoherent. For coherent, you need to take into account that you have amplitude of probability that your Pine decays in different points. A given, even single pine, it has amplitude of probability to decay in different parts of your, of your, uh, of your decay tunnel. So then everything should be at a summation at the amplitude level, not at the probability level. So we have two long papers, and I have no really time to. to but if someone is interested, you can look at these papers. Now. Possible to consider uh, an average of the position where the pion would decay and translate this this, uh, this average into the uncertainty of. A well, if you do this averaging, then essentially you destroy coherence, and that would correspond immediately to incoherent situation. Now, now we are ready really to to have the picture, what's going on with uh, how how particles oscillate. So let's take muon neutrino. And I will discuss this in terms of two neutrino mixing for simplicity. Two neutrino mixing, I'm considering mixing of muon neutrino with tau neutrino. And therefore, muon neutrino is cosine theta, and this is mixing angle, nu2, plus sine theta, nu3. And I'm taking two, uh, nu2 and nu3. Well, actually, this is a realistic situation for, say, atmospheric neutrino oscillations, when we have oscillations of muon to tau. Nu tau is orthogonal combination of nu 2 and nu 3. And this combination differs by this admixture of nu 2 and nu 3, but also importantly by the sign here. Here is a minus sign, which means that here the uh, phase difference between nu 2 and nu 3 is 0. Both enter with plus sign. And here is the phase difference is pi, which is just gives you this minus sign. Okay. So my muon neutrino propagation is described by propagation of nu2 and nu3 wave packets. So this is wave packet which corresponds to nu2, and this is wave packet which corresponds to nu3. Of course, wave packet is, is, is symmetric up and down, so it should be like, like this, right? But just for, for better kind of uh, visibility, I just take part of half, upper half of the wave packet, OK? Remember, we had this formula for the uh, wave packet, which is the product of uh, shape factor and uh, the phase factor. So that uh, this is given by shape factor. Actually, I put here this uh, simplest form, but it may be, as in the previous slides, it can be quite sophisticated form of the wave packet or shape factor. And this is uh, the phase factor, which is determined by average 
momentum and average energy in the wave packet. And so I put here this oscillatory dependence, which reflects this phase factor. Okay? Right? Agree? Now, each of these mass states actually has different flavors. So inverting this relation, remember in the beginning of lecture I discussed this, you get that mu2 is combination of nu mu and nu tau. And nu3 is also combination orthogonal of uh, nu tau and nu mu. Okay? And I have shown this by, by colors. So that mu on neutrino is approximately, say, half of, uh, of uh, muon flavor and uh, half of tau flavor in realistic case, because we know that mixing between uh, muon and tau is close to maximal. And also, nu3 is combination of nu mu and nu tau parts. So this is the portrait of uh, muon neutrino. Propagating muon neutrino. Agree? And this is just ref reflects the formulas, which you can see here. Shape factor, oscillatory, phase factor, and then nu2 and nu3 are kind of uh, have a flavor content, non-trivial because of mixing. So uh, nu2 consists of nu mu and uh, nu tau, and uh, nu3 consists of nu mu, again, nu mu and nu tau. Agree? But then you can ask, so how come that you have in this state also new tau already in the beginning, right? But you are describing new mu. And the point is that these blue parts, which correspond to new tau, they cancel each other because of this minus sign. So to have new tau, you need to have new 2 and new 3 in opposite phase, it should be minus sign. And here what I have written, you see, peak is here and peak is here, so they coincide. So these two wave packets, they are in phase, so they have the same phase. And due to this additional minus sign, these blue parts cancel. And this why this state it shows up as muon neutrino. This is nothing but just these formulas. Agree? I just make this picture because I, in the second lecture, I will use this type of representation and, and we will uh, we'll discuss more uh, complicated stuff. So this is portrait of muon neutrino. Although, Nu2 and Nu3 have both muon and tau parts, but tau parts cancel because of this sign here. Okay? Uh, so now how propagation occurs? So a given neutrino state, propagating state, can be written in this form. It again reflects what, we, what you saw in the previous slide. It's cosine theta. Then this is shape factor of second neutrino nu2, sine, this is shape factor of, uh, of the third neutrino. And here what we have the phase factor, which is F3 minus F2. And these are phases in phase factor. I just put out factor exponent minus phi2, and therefore this phase appears only here, because overall phase doesn't matter, OK? So if the phase here is 0, then we have just muon neutrino. If, however, the phase start to develop, phase difference start to develop, then component of nu tau will appear in originally produced muon neutrino flux. And therefore, we will have appearance of nu tau. So the constellation of 
tau components in the state which I have shown you before occurs only for definite phase difference. In my conventions, it's zero. In the course of propagation, additional phase difference appears. And so this state for non-zero f will not be orthogonal to tau neutrino, which means that you have appearance of your, uh, in your beam tau neutrinos. So this is what happens. So we have difference of new two and masses of new two and new three, which leads to difference of phase velocities, and therefore phase difference increase. And this phase difference increase is given by delta m square over l uh, over two energies usually. So what happens is that uh, there's a shift of the phases in the wave packet new two and new three, and this leads to oscillations. So let me again come to this uh, picture. So this is muon neutrino, but when this state starts to propagate, it will be phase difference. So here they are in phase, but then due to propagation, you will have shift of these oscillatory patterns. And therefore, the constellation of these blue parts will be removed. And therefore, you will have appearance of tau component in your propagating neutrino state. And this is what is called neutrino oscillation. This is how neutrino oscillations are developed. Now let me come back and derive formula. And before this, let me still focus on the oscillation phase, which is actually also quite non-trivial uh, stuff. So you have this phase difference, and this each individual phase is, uh, remember, given by average energy and momentum in the wave packet. So it is, uh, and P is given by, by this. It's just usual relation. And you want to compute this phase difference, which is in general given by delta E, difference of average energies, time minus uh, delta P, difference of momenta, multiplied by x. It's kind of endless discussion in this oscillation business. What one should take different equal energies or equal momenta in your wave packets of mass states? So the answer is that, in general, both energies, average energies, and momenta are different. And this is general consideration, without any assumption of if I take equal energies or equal momenta. Now let me take a given delta E, and then I can compute what is delta corresponding delta P. So just making this uh, 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 differentiation of, of this relation. So it's dP over the energy times delta E. And then since P depends on mass, it's a dP over delta uh, uh, mass square, delta M square. And I will get this expression for, for delta P, which corresponds to a given delta E. Then I insert this delta P in this expression here. And I will get the following formula for the phase, oscillation phase, phase difference. Here also there is some subtlety. Okay, What you see here, the phase difference, this is phase difference or oscillation phase, has two components. One is delta m square, and it is due to this term because delta p is different because of difference of delta ma masses, m1, m m2, and m3 in my case. So delta m squared over two energies, and this is x is the propagation distance. So this is the standard oscillation phase. But there is another term here. What is that? So here is delta e uh, over group velocity. Delta E is delta M of the order of delta M squared over two energies. So this is difference of average energies in two wave packets. And of course, if delta M squared is 0, they are, should be equal. And therefore, this is of the order of this delta M squared over two energies. Now, what is staying here is V group velocity time minus x. And this is precisely argument in our shape factor. And therefore, this difference is, should be smaller of, of the order of the width of the wave packet, which is sigma x. I denote this by sigma x, because then you have the kind of exponential decrease. So that difference is of, of the order of the size of the wave packet. So the first term 
turns out to be smaller or of the order of sigma x delta m squared over two energies. So this is what is the first term. And this is nothing but oscillation phase which is acquired on the size of the wave packet. And the size of the wave packet is determined by, say, size of the production reg region, so to say. Usually, this is very small quantity. So this is, again, if you have your production region, which determines the wave packet, small enough so that oscillation length is much bigger. This is what it happens usually. Then the first term can be neglected. Actually, the first term describes here the oscillation effect within the production region. So this is interpretation of this first term. Usually it is neglected, but in principle you should keep in mind that it may be some, some additional correction. So this also means when you neglect this that you can neglect phase difference between two wave packets uh, along the wave packets. So that wave packets, so the, uh, the phase difference is the same in all parts of the wave packets. So, so you have PIDI and yeah. then P and E, are they the average of these two? No, I don't introduce any average. Well, may, maybe here, but it doesn't matter. It, it, it produces correction of the next order. So now I, I even remove these indices and just consider this without any indices. I introduce delta E, which is uh, difference of the energies, and delta P, which is difference of corresponding momentum. Uh, that, that you need to compute. That depends on, on, on the process of the production, on the size of oh, the okay. production region. So in principle, you need, and you can find what is, uh, what is this average energy and momentum. Oh, okay. Is there any exotic phenomena that, uh, where the phase difference, the first term is not in the region? Oh yeah, if you have big uh, production region, size of production region, uh, then you need to take into account oscillation effects uh, in the production region. That actually can lead to additional averaging effect eventually. Yeah, yeah, so not th this is nothing kind of exotic. This is again oscillation effect because it has such an expression. This is essentially inverse of oscillation lengths, and this is the size of the, of the wave packet. And size of the wave packet, say, roughly is determined by the size of the production region. So that's nothing but oscillation effect in the production region. You automatically take into account this uh, first term if you make also take into account finite size of the production region, an oscillation effect in this uh, oscillation region. So now what are the oscillations? Let me just show the picture. You saw already this uh, new mu portrait and then after some problem, and the phase difference here is uh, is zero, you see the phase here and here is the same. So this is muon neutrino. After a while you will get this one. And the difference is that now there is a shift between oscillatory pattern here and oscillatory pattern here. So you see here it's maximum, here is minimum. The phase difference is pi. And the state which you see here is nu tau if the mixing is close to maximum. So you have this type of the thing. So that's actually uh, how oscillations show up. You have these wave packets which propagate. The flavor of the wave packets doesn't change. The only what changes is this phase difference. And is this what actually leads to oscillations? Neither the flavor of eigenstates nor the size. Size is the same, right? So this, this is as it was before. And the only what changes here is the phase difference of these oscillatory patterns. So and this is oscillation. Okay. So I haven't discussed much about detection. And actually detection is as important as the production. And in a sense it is symmetric detection and production. So you need to take into account also what is the process of the detection, what are characteristics of the detection, what are the properties or wave packets of the particles on which 
neutrino dense scatters. And all this can be taken into account by introduction of the kind of generalized wave packet, which takes into account both properties of production and properties of the detection. And now oscillation, uh, computation of oscillation amplitude is trivial. Again, I have this expression for the state which oscillates. This is uh, the formula for muon neutrino. I compute the matrix element of this type using this state, which depends on time. And this is expression for uh, new mu. And I'm getting such an expression for, for the amplitude of, of uh, to find muon neutrino in a given uh, 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 propagating neutrino state. So then I compute, this is again the same expression, then I compute moduli square to find the probability. And what I'm doing here, I'm integrating over x. So what I want to find is the probability to find muon neutrino in the moment of time t. I can similarly do integration over time for a given point x. So then I will find what is the probability to find muon neutrino in a given point x, independently on time. So what I will get finally, do this computation, so what this is the probability. I took moduli square of this element and integrate over x from, say, minus uh, infinity to plus infinity. And I will get the following expression. So here I have cosine to the fourth power, which appears from this term, and sine to the fourth power. And shape factors disappear because I assume that these shape factors are normalized. And here is just moduli square, which appears here. And after integration, they give me 1. However, shape factors still are kept in the interference term when I have product of these two elements. And so they depend on the shape factor. Now, if uh, shape factors are the same for nu3 and nu2, and when you have no separation, as usually this happens, then this gives me again one, and I will get standard, and I will get the standard formula for neutrino oscillations. And this is standard formula is one minus sine squared two theta sine squared theta half of the phase. And the phase is given by this standard expression, and L nu is the standard oscillation length. So after all this kind of headache, we are getting this. Simple usual formula. However, deriving this, I avoided a number of very subtle questions. By the way, if uh, we have separation of the wave packets, if, then I will have G3 and G2, which are different. They may be in the different space time points. Then this integral matters. And they, if they stop to overlap, then this integral is 0. And I will get only these two terms which correspond to average neutrino oscillations. So maybe I will finish by just uh, briefly discussing this. This is separation of the wave packets. So we started with this picture. And then after a while, because the wave packets have different group velocities, they start to separate. And in such a situation, you will have no interference term, which is shown in the previous slide. And this is what we called um, propagation, loss of co uh, propagation coherence. So this is due to separation of the wave packets. So the wave packet, so the wave function of our state is, in this case, is quite funny. It has two components. One is in this place, another in another place. And you can ask me about entanglement and things like that, which people are discussing with this respect. Let me see what I have. Here is some derivation. And I'm not sure that I will do, and I will have time to, to do these uh, uh, estimations of uh, how uh, quickly the wave packets uh, are. Uh, maybe I will still do this in, in the second lecture. Um, one thing is, and actually, Dia Bay collaboration um, made the studies to, to find out which kind of the bound on the wave packets one can get on the size. Uh, and for instance, if the wave packets are very small and they diverge, then Dia Bay experiment, this is a reactor experiment, they would not see oscillatory pattern because of averaging. 
And from the fact that Diabase sees this, they can put the bound on, <coughs> on the size of the wave packets. Although this bound is quite weak, so we can estimate what is realistically the bound, knowing that these are decays of nuclei inside the, the nuclear core, and what is the temperature of the core, so we can actually find out what is the size of the wave packet. So the bound is, uh, is, uh, is much weaker. And, but anyway, so there are some kind of attempts to, to find out what is this. And the wave packets are, are something which is real. It is not just uh, we do something and, uh, uh, which is not very relevant. The second point is that nature is very kind to us. And it is kind to us because uh, in various circumstances, Either we have complete separation of the wave packets, like, for instance, for solar neutrinos. On the way from the sun to the Earth, the wave packets sub certainly separate. And so what arrives at the surface of the sun, or the Earth, are just the fluxes of mass states of neutrinos. And that should be taken into account when you do computations. If you then don't take this into account, you would get a completely different result. Now, the second point is, in other circumstances, the separation is very weak, so you can neglect this. And so we are in a situation which was indicated sorry, uh, here, when uh, these G2 and G3 are uh, the same, and essentially this is one. Otherwise, if you are in an intermediate situation, it's to predict the effects, you need really to know what are the shapes of these wave packets, and the things would be much more complicated. So in a sense, we are lucky that, that nature uh, make these kind of configurations for us. Now, coming to uh, uh, this uh, propagation coherence, <coughs> one can estimate what is difference of group velocities of the wave packets. It's just given by delta m square over two energy squared. Um, you just compute what is the group velocity of each of the wave packets, you get this. And then the separation of the wave packets on the distance L is given by this expression, just multiply by L. And then overlap actually uh, doesn't exist if uh, this uh, distance is bigger than the size of the wave packets. And from here you can find so-called coherence lengths which is the length over which you have complete separation of the wave packets and therefore loss of the coherence. And it is given by sigma x, which is the size of the wave packet, E square over delta m square. So this is very big factor, and so therefore the coherence length is actually quite big. The same thing can be obtained in the uh, energy momentum space. So this is in configuration space. In configuration space, you have separation of the wave packet. In quantum mechanics, you always have complementarity. You can solve the problem in configuration space or to see the same in energy momentum space. So what happens is the following in energy momentum space. You can uh, estimate what is the period of oscillatory pattern in energy. So if you have oscillations, then what you will get in energy scale you will have modulation, oscillatory modulation of your signal because of oscillations. So you can compute what is the period in this energy scale of, of modulations. And this is given by this uh, requirement that the phase difference should be 2 pi. And this is period in energy scale. And it's easy to compute that this energy period is just given by this expression. So you can use this. You have delta E. You know what is the oscillation length. You can find, you can find uh, this period. And of course, if uh, sigma, now the size of the wave packet in energy scale, is bigger than this period, you will have averaging. Separation of the wave packets, therefore, in energy momentum space, corresponds to averaging of oscillations. Okay, So this is complementary. Now there is this important observation. I'm saying this because it was questioned during coffee break, or during the lunch break, is that if you have very good energy resolution in your detector, if you have very good energy resolution in your detector, then you can restore coherence. That is, you will still observe the oscillatory pattern. Even though your wave packets 
are separated, you will see interference effect. This can be understood in very classical example. For instance, you have pendulum. You have pendulum and suppose you have two times knock this pendulum. Okay? And that would correspond to arrival of two wave packets here. So suppose your pendulum has practically no friction. So which means that if you excite this pendulum, it will vibrate for a long, long period. Okay? So the first pulse is coming, first wave packet, it's the, it excite your pendulum, pendulum start to, I don't know, to vibrate. Then when second pulse is coming, your pendulum still vibrates, and therefore the result of second knock will depend on how your pendulum vibrated before. And so you will have coherent effect of these two hits of your pendulum. Suppose you have pendulum with big friction. So you first knock your pendulum and start to vibrate, but before the second pulse arrives, it already stopped. And therefore, effect of the second knock will not depend on what happened before, right? So what you need to have, you, have, you need to have long coherence time. So this kind of absence of friction would correspond to long, co long coherence time. And uh, uh, so, which means that your system remembers how your first pulse affected it. And therefore, effect of the second one will depend on what happened in the first moment. Right, so this is restoration of coherence. So in spite of the fact that you have separation of the wave packets, you may still have oscillation pattern. Okay? You can still observe, uh, observe oscillations. Um, so that is actually what Stadolsky theorem, to some extent, uh, uh, tells us. So independently if your wave packet separated or not, you should worry on the energy resolution of your detector and energy spectrum of produced neutrinos. And then do appropriate averaging or integration over energies. And then you will get the same results without referring to wave packets. Okay, so this is what Stadowski theorem is saying. Forget about your wave packets in space. Just do appropriate integration over energy with energy resolution at the detection and production, and you will get correct result. So if you have good energy resolution, you can restore your coherence, even though your wave packets were separated. Actually, when two wave packets are separated, it's still not a loss of information because still the phases in these two packets are correlated. They remember each other, right? So it's not like you have thermalized something and you lost coherence. In this way, you are not losing information, although your wave packets were separated. Now, um, I will not discuss, I decided not to talk about spread, spread of the wave packets, just to say, of course, uh, the wave packet produced as a narrow one will then, uh, will then be bigger of the size, and at some point it becomes like a classical, and it corresponds to the fact that higher energies of uh, neutri neutrinos of higher energies will arrive first to your detector, and lower energies later. Though this is just one example. For solar beryllium neutrinos, you can find that sigma, the size of the wave packet, is by the way 16 to the minus 8 centimeters. And the spread will be 14 to the minus 6 centimeters when these neutrinos will arrive at there. So this is an example which shows that you have separation of the wave packets. Right? The sigma is much smaller than this. Now um, the uh, Spread of the, sorry, this is, this is spread of the wave packets, 6, 10 to the minus 6. Separation of the wave packets is much bigger, it's 2, 10 to the minus 3 centimeters. Okay. So this is kind of summary of uh, different effects, what happens when neutri neutrinos oscillate, when neutrinos propagate, or when wave packets propagate. So you have phase difference change between two wave packets, and that leads to oscillations. 
you have separation of the wave packets, which leads to loss of the propagation coherence. And you have spread of individual wave packets, which lead actually lost to loss of the coherence even within each of the wave packets. Now, suppose we solve all these problems with wave packets, and suppose we have no separation of the wave packets. Therefore, we can kind of formulate almost like point-like theory for neutrino oscillations. And you can write the equation of motion. And uh, so this is kind of Schrodinger-like equation for three neutrinos here. And the Hamiltonian in vacuum is just given by the product of mass matrices, mass matrix, mass matrix dagger, over two energies. Actually, you can derive this exactly, starting from even Dirac equation if you want. But uh, physically, what's going on is this is just analogy to the situation with a single neutrino. And for single neutrino, the energy, which is Hamiltonian, is P plus M squared over two energies. Now, when you go to three neutrinos, you promote this M squared to mass matrix. And so instead of M squared, you will have M, M dagger. And then you omit this P, which is for convenience, you can take the same for three neutrino species in this framework. Okay? And therefore, you can uh, eliminate this P because it is the same for all three neutrinos, and therefore, it doesn't produce any phase difference. And then you just arrive to a question of this type, when H is energy, the Hamiltonian is the energy. Okay? So this is physics derivation of, of, uh, of, of this equation of motion. And solving this equation, you are getting this oscillation picture, which I have discussed. Now, um, you can express this MM dagger as uh, diagonalized mass matrix, and then these are mixing matrices, U and U dagger. And diagonal mass matrix square is just given by this M1 square, M2 square, and M3 square. Now, you can do this, find, uh, write this exp uh, uh, equation explicitly in the case of three, two neutrino case, very simply. So now I will use this. Uh, again, we have this Hamiltonian, and these are the mass matrices. And then this is uh, the mixing matrix. And the two neutrino case, you have just single uh, mixing angle. This is your mixing matrix. And therefore, uh, this Hamiltonian just can be expressed in this way. This is delta m squared over four energies. This is minus cosine 2 theta. This is sine 2 theta. And this is cosine 2 theta in symmetric form. You always can uh, you know, reduce your Hamiltonian to this form. Question? Excuse me? Yeah? The moment can be different for different flavors in the previous video? Yeah, so, uh, so remember, so we have taken for simplicity uh, the same moment, and then it is, that's, uh, that simplifies mm -hmm. other things. Yeah. And you, yeah, yeah, and you can, and, and this consider, if you, if you have no separate, if you don't worry about separation of the wave packets, then you can do this. Well, it's, you can take the same energy if you want, and you will get the same, the same result. You can check. It's interesting, but you will get the same result. You can take the same energy, or, same, or even, uh, sorry, in what, what I have discussed, uh, you can take something which is intermediate, and, and still you will get this type of the equation. What's the relativistic limit? Well, this is, this is relativistic limit, because what I did here, remember, I have written energy of neutrino. I just put the instead of square root of p square or m square. This this expression. Now let me introduce very important notion, which actually simplifies consideration enormously. So let me introduce neutrino polarization vector in the flavor space. So we have two neutrinos. So let's take electron neutrino and new tau. I put prime because. Uh, in realistic case, it's a mixture of a new tau and new mu. And then I can introduce polarization vector as the following product. This is sigma dagger, Pauli matrix over 2, and again sigma. So this is bilinear form in our uh, wave functions of, uh, of neutrinos. Okay. Explicitly, this P, it has three components, is uh, then if you write uh, in terms of new E and new tau, is a real part of new E 
dagger, new tau, imaginary part, and then this combination. So that follows just from, from this expression for polarization vector. Actually, these three components are nothing but elements of density matrix, if you want. But I will not use density matrix formalism here. Now, let me write a question of motion, find a question of motion for this polarization vector. So this is what I have for the wave functions. Right? I can write this equation for wave functions in the following form. So uh, essentially H, which you saw in the previous, in the previous uh, slide, can be written as the scalar product of vector B times sigma over 2. And B is 2 pi over L nu sine 2 theta 0, and this is cosine 2 theta. I can just rewrite this equation of motion you saw before in this form, okay, where B is given by this expression. You can check this. I don't want to, to, to derive this into details. Now, let's take this vector, differentiate it, and so I will have something which is dp, and then I will have derivative of this time plus term with derivative of this part. And then I will use this expression, this expression for d psi over dt. And eventually I will arrive at the equation for this polarization vector, which is dp over dt equals minus b times p. OK? Sorry, what is the new tau prime? Tau prime is, if you want, it's tau. But just to be connected to realistic case, I can reduce standard three neutrino oscillations yeah, when I have some mixture of new tau and uh, new mu. So tau prime is mixture of new tau and new mu. But it doesn't matter for, 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 for this consideration. It's just a second neutrino. Okay? So here, polarization, like, I mean, one polarization is electron neutrino, the other polarization? No, 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 no. So this is polarization in, in flavor space. And I will show you next slide, and you will understand better. So it is clear. So I start with. Uh, with uh, these uh, wave functions of two neutrinos. I have this equation for uh, these wave functions written in terms of product, scalar product of this type of the vector over sigma over 2. I introduce vector p, polarization vector, and then differentiating this dp over dt. And using these equations, I'm arriving at the equation for, for p, polarization vector. But this is stra straightforward way you can, you can check this. But what is interesting, the shape of this equa equation is, I think you, you, you know what is this. This coincides with the equation for the electron spin precession in the magnetic field. Yeah? Oh, over there, what is L nu? What is? L nu in the peak. Oh, so sorry. Yeah, this is oscillation length, right. So remember, I have uh, written this is 4 pi energy of neutrino and delta m squared. Delta m squared will be in nominator. So let me again remind we have this expression for L mu. I don't know if I really need. So that's, uh, that's uh, L mu. L nu is 4 pi energy over delta m squared. And this is obtained from the condition that the phase equals 2 pi. And so this is the distance over which the phase becomes 2 pi, and therefore the system is coming back to its initial state. So this is period of oscillations or oscillation lengths. Thank you. More questions? So for the, maybe you might mention for the I express of P3 component of uh, the, 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 the OK, so let me. So this is uh, new dagger, new minus one half. Constant to one half. So this is, this is just constant, yeah? What? So then my question is, if I take mu e and mu top prime zero. Yes. Then it should be zero. If I take both this one and this, if I take this uh, new e, then it will be minus one half. Maybe I will show you next slide, and then it will be clear. So this is this is a geometrical picture of what is shown before. 
And the only what I put here, the index m, because uh, in general, this is valid also in matter, but one needs to substitute the angle in matter uh, in vacuum by angle in matter. So this is very general. So what we have here is the following. Uh, we have polarization vector, and the length of polarization is one half, actually. This is what is related to, to, to the previous. Like a spin. Spin, it has one half. Now, what are the axes? Axis is this PZ, PY, and PX, these components, uh, three dimen components of this polarization vector. Now, P describes uh, the spin of electron or neutrino polarization vector. B is, is this vector, which was given by mixing angle in vacuum in the previous plot. But this is the same when you have in, in, in matter. The angle just changes. The shape is the same. Now, the probability to find electron neutrino in your state is given by projection of this vector onto axis pz, like in the case of spin physics. So if you started with electron neutrino, then probability of electron neutrino go to electron neutrino is given by this, or is given by this z component plus one half. <coughs> okay. So what happens is, like in the case of spinning magnetic field, spin start to precess around direction of magnetic field, right? So B vector plays the role of magnetic field. And so what happens if you produce electron neutrino, your vector is directed in this way. So this is, that would correspond to electron neutrino. And then it starts to precess around the magnetic field. And this is the phase of, of, of oscillations or phase of precession. Now you compute pro uh, projection onto the axis z, add one half, and then you will get this probability. So this is what we call flavor space here. And then neutrino state is described by the vector of the length one half in this space. And then you have vector b, which is uh, given by 2 pi, this oscillation length in matter or in vacuum. And this is the corresponding mixing angle. So it's in the plane pz, px. This component is 0. And you will have precession of your polarization vector uh, around this B vector. I will use this analogy heavily when I will discuss different matter effects. So please ask me questions. What is? Well, this is mixing angle in vacuum if it is in vacuum. So this is to uh, double of mixing angle. So that's this angle which actually gives the direction of this magnetic field. And it comes from this formula. So theta cone is equal to 2 theta n? In this case, yes. But it's just for this specific case. Then you will see the cases when this cone angle differs from uh, 2 theta n. So that, that I will come later to this. But how can I know p tau, tau probability? Oh, so OK. Uh, so if I compute PEE, -E, then PE tau will be just 1 minus this. Different. And uh, PU nu tau would correspond when my polarization vector is directed down. Hmm. In such a situation, I will never have, so it, my P will be just processed in this way. And the biggest amount of nu tau would correspond when my polarization vector in this position. So that will be the smallest projection, the smallest projection on this axis z, and smallest amount of uh, electron neutrino. Uh, do we know PY and PX projection to PX and PY? Sorry? PX and PY projection. Well, that, that's kind of, if you want to have flavor probabilities, you need to make projection on Z axis. It's like a, what, what is uh, usually when you have a spin of the electron. So what we are interested in saying projection on the axis Z. This uh, X and Y are just giving the space for, for this precession. Uh, OK, one more question is, we know the formula, the 
probability you share. Yeah. Right. It's the same thing, but why do you use this uh, very easy okay. way? You, you will see it's much more convenient, and you will see soon why it is convenient. I, I will not need to write some trigonometric expression formulas of the length of few pages, and I will see some effects using this analogy. Do you call that P space as later space? Yeah. That's the uh, terminology. And there is one subtle thing. Uh, is, is that Px and Py should be changed in the future? Well, you can, you can change, uh, but uh, what is the difference? Again, so what has a physical meaning is, uh, is this projection which changes periodically, right? So when you have precession uh, around this B, then projection of P on this axis Z periodically changes. And this is absolute equivalent to oscillations. So and this is how it looks like. So you start from, say, electron neutrino, and then that precesses. And uh, so that's our oscillation effect. And here you can find uh, the references which are used for, for, for this lecture.